Good afternoon. I'm Ilsa Connect, and I am the Deputy Director of Public Policy for the National Center for Victims of Crime. And I want to welcome you to today's webinar, Using DNA to Solve Missing Persons, Homicide, and Trafficking Cases. I want to go through just a couple of housekeeping um, issues for you. And of course, if you can hear me now, you uh, can pretty much ignore the slide about how to get connected, but you should be hearing audio over your computer speakers if you um, have not called in. And if you can't hear, try turning on or adjusting the sound, the volume on your speakers. If you have any technical issues during the webinar, uh, please call WebEx support at 866-229-3239. Uh, you may send us a, a, a chat or a question about what's going on on your end, but we uh, have limited ability to help you, so WebEx support is probably your best option. I want to let everyone know that as you called in today, um, you were muted upon entry to the call. So that means that you would not be able to ask a question verbally, but we do encourage you to ask a question using the question and answer tool in WebEx. I'm going to show you what that looks like. Um, during the webinar, you may either see it uh, in a full screen view or in a partial screen view. Many of you are probably seeing the partial screen view. You have some panels on the right side of your screen. There's a question and answer panel there. You may have to maximize it by clicking on the little arrow next to where it says Q&A. Type your question in the small box at the bottom of that panel and hit the send button. And uh, your questions are not seen by other attendees, just by the panelists. So we're going to do our best to answer questions today. We do have a very full presentation. So if we don't get to your question today, we will follow up with you by email. And I want to note, everyone to note that the chat function on the panel is um, not enabled for the webinar. So if you do need to reach us in any way, just use that question and answer tool, and we'll get uh, to you as soon as we can. Okay, many of you logged on and said, where's the poll? Because we kept saying, please take the poll, please take the poll. But um, we had a little snafu with that. Now we have the poll up. So if you would all be able to, um, might, wouldn't mind taking a chance to answer that poll for us. We'll leave that up for a little while now. These um, polls just help us, help us measure the effectiveness of our training. So we'll leave that up for a little bit for folks to take the poll. Okay, I want to just talk a little bit about the National Center for Victims of Crime. And first, we're very pleased to bring you this webinar today with the support of Applied Biosystems and Life Technologies. Applied Biosystems is a DNA technology company that we have been working with for several years now on increasing knowledge of how DNA technology can be used to assist criminal investigations. So we're very thankful for their support for this webinar series. This is the fifth webinar in a series of six. More information about the webinars we have since uh, conducted so far is on our website. I'll give you that address in a minute. And the previous webinars were recorded, and the information um, and links to those recordings and PowerPoints are also on our website. Our last webinar coming up soon will feature a cold case detective um, talking about working unsolved cases. We don't have a date for that yet, but please stay tuned. I want to just tell you a little bit about the National Center before I turn the webinar over to our presenters. The National Center's mission is to forge a national commitment to help victims of crime rebuild their lives. We do this through direct support to all victims of crime on our National Crime Victim Helpline, 1-800-FYI-CALL, and through our website. We provide training and technical assistance to those who work with victims, and we work with Congress to secure rights and resources for victims and funding for victims of services, for victim services, excuse me. And quickly, we do um, have a DNA Resource Center online. We've been doing work on, on increasing understanding of forensic DNA for um, since about 2002. We have a lot of resources on this site. Uh, we are going to be holding in-person trainings in the fall, one in Las Vegas and one in Raleigh. And we are, have, of course, more webinars in the works. We have a listserv for, for those who are interested in DNA-related issues. And we have developed some materials for DNA about DNA for professionals who work with victims. So visit this website. You'll find out all that information there. And this is my contact information. Uh, if you want to email me with any questions or you want to join the DNA listserv, and um, you can uh, email dnaanswers at ncvc.org, or that is my cell phone number. OK. And so now we're going to hear from today's speakers. 
I'm very, very thrilled to have some of the country's foremost experts on this issue as our speakers today. I cannot do their resumes justice in the time that we have, but please do look at their resumes on our website. And we're first going to hear from Dr. Art Eisenberg, who is the co-director of the University of North Texas Center for Human Identification. He is a full professor and chairman of the Department of Forensic and Investigative Genetics at the University of North Texas Health Science Center. For the past several years, his lab has been funded by the National Institute of Justice to perform DNA analysis on unidentified human remains and family reference samples to help identify missing persons throughout the United States. BJ Spammer joined the Center for Human Identification's Forensic Services Unit as a program manager in June of this year. Prior to this, she spent almost nine years with the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, where she assisted medical examiners, coroners, law enforcement officers, and family members with long-term missing and unidentified child cases. Officer George Adams has been with the University of North Texas Health Service Science Center since 2005 and is a program manager for the Forensic Services Unit at the Center for Human Identification. He also serves on the National Missing Persons and Unidentified Persons System, also known as NamUs. He holds an advanced regular police officer's license and commission under the University of North Texas Health Science Center Police Department. So we are going to start with Art, and I am going to hand over the controls to Art now. Welcome, Art, and you now have the floor. Well, thank you, Elsa. And it's a real pleasure to address all of you that are participating in this uh, webinar. And um, hopefully uh, you'll get a better understanding of the magnitude of the problem that exists uh, within the United States, and potentially uh, you'll be able to apply things that you're going to hear about uh, to help assist you all in uh, dealing with cases of missing, unidentified, and if we have time, uh, things relative to um, uh, human trafficking, especially that of children. Uh, the first slide, as you see, I really set, I think gives you a, an idea of, of how things have changed over the last, uh, you know, uh, 20 uh, plus years. Uh, as you see, in 1982, there were about 150,000 missing person reports that were made to law enforcement. And, uh, you know, as little as a year or two ago, there were almost 800,000. So you're looking at, you know, somewhere around a 500% increase in the number of missing person reports uh, annually made to law enforcement. That's a, a significant change. But when we look specifically at... Um, things involving active cases. Any given day in the United States, there are over 100,000 uh, active missing person cases, where uh, about half of them, the last known contact with these individuals were well over a year. And as many of you are aware, that uh, tens of thousands of individuals, both children and adults, vanish each year under what's termed suspicious circumstances. So for many years, uh, there has been speculation as to how many actual unidentified decedents exist in medical examiner's offices, coroner's offices, law enforcement agencies um, without, within the United States. Oop, I don't know what's going on there. But um, essentially the speculation was that there was probably at least 40,000 or more skeletal remains being stored. And these are remains that could not be identified by those tools available to those agencies at the time these bodies were found. And essentially, they just sat there. Or even worse, these bodies were buried without retention of samples, buried in uh, pauper's graves as Jane and John Doe's. Or even the worst case, uh, these bodies were cremated uh, and no samples were retained. Well, um, in 2007, the uh, Bureau of Justice Statistics actually released a report in which in the year 2004, a snapshot in time, they actually surveyed uh, law enforcement agencies. Uh, I'm not sure why the slides are changing by themselves, but they surveyed law enforcement agencies that, um, as to what, what remains they had on hand. And the number that they came up with was approximately 13,500. Uh, and that was well below what was expected to be found. Probably the relevant statistic is that these uh, agencies reported about each year, there are about 4,400 new cases of unidentified human um, decedents that are received in the, uh, in the offices. 
After one year, there were still about a thousand of these bodies that remained unidentified and essentially became cold cases. Now, what was very alarming, out of those thousand cases, about 60% of these remains were disposed of through burial or cremation. And no one knew exactly what percentage of those actually had samples retained for uh, further studies. Uh, and again, an alarming uh, statistic was that only approximately half of these agents actually had any policies uh, towards uh, records retain uh, retention on these unidentified remains. The then director of the Bureau of Justice Statistics acknowledged that that number, um, 13,500, was probably a significant underestimate, uh, again related to those bodies that have been previously buried or cremated. But one of the startling things was that out of the 13,500 that they had identified, less than half had entries in an NCIC. And of those that had entries into NCIC, 25% uh, of them were known homicides, and at least an additional 25% uh, were uh, these were also homicide victims. So I think the salient take-home message is that a significant portion of the unidentified remain decedents that exist uh, in this country are more, most likely murder victims. And I think it's, it's pretty, it's not a far stretch to understand that it's almost impossible to start a murder investigation if you don't know who the victim is. And Jeffrey Sedgwick went on to say that most likely that advances in DNA technology um, could help identify these remains and you potentially give, he used the word closure, but uh, some type of resolution could be brought to these families. And through the identification process, hopefully this could lead to investigations that could lead to the apprehension conviction of those responsible for the death of the, of the decedent. The problem that exists is that they're actually, although there are uh, over 180 um, CODIS laboratories in this country equipped uh, with the latest molecular techniques, or at least those that uh, relate to STRs, there are actually very few crime labs that have experience and training in uh, doing DNA analysis on human remains. It's something that they do uh, either uh, very sporadic or not at all. And the other problem that's identified is that the laws that control what happens to these unidentified remains um, need to be strengthened. Many cities, counties, due to space issues, are still burying or cremating these unidentified decedents without an attempt to retain samples or um, send samples for DNA analysis. So I think what is clear and what uh, we know is that this problem has really gone unrecognized when you, you look at things related to disasters such as the World Trade Center, the tsunami, in Southeast Asia. These are events, one-off events, but this problem has existed in the United States going back 20, 30, 40, 50 years, and, and the term, our, our nation's silent mass disaster in terms of this huge numbers of remains, potentially murder victims, that have um, gone unidentified. Uh, and you'll see we've received significant funding some, uh, since 2004 from the National Institute of Justice originally under what was uh, called the DNA uh, uh, President's DNA Initiative, to essentially fund a program that combines not only the DNA, advanced DNA technology to try and help identify these remains, but also the support of a forensic anthropology lab, and as you'll hear uh, later about the, uh, the work of the Forensic Services Unit, which really are reaching out to law enforcement agencies and other groups involved in trying to identify these remains and, and providing critical support. Most importantly, the funds that we've received allow us to do our work at no direct cost to these agencies. So all of the testing, the DNA testing, the forensic anthropology, and the support and access to the forensic services unit is available to you all at absolutely no cost. So the mission here is to try and identify these human uh, decedents. Uh, through the work of the forensic anthropology team to try and ascertain cause, manner of, of death of these individuals, and through the processing of family reference samples and other samples that are needed to try and identify the missing, establish some basis for the identification of individuals reported missing. Again, you can see here we've received a significant amount of money, 
at this point over $10 million, and, and the uh, grants uh, through the National Institute of Justice are listed below. So up in the Denton campus, uh, campus is my other co-director, Dr. Harold Gil King, uh, board-certified forensic anthropologist, truly one of the uh, nation's leading French uh, anthropologists, who's been doing this work for, for more than 30 years, not only here in Texas, not only in the boarding states, but throughout the United States. And you can see a whole list of activities that the Laboratory of Forensic Anthropology um, provide, not only to us as the molecular team, but to you as law enforcement agencies. First of all, the identification, distinction between human and non-human remains, um, those of archeological or historical remains, really uh, a cost savings and a time savings rather than just delving into the, the DNA work. Uh, they're responsible for making many identifications on their own by the methods that are shown uh, on the slide. They also have a forensic odontologist that can compile dental uh, records and convey these dental records digitally throughout the United States for, for dental comparisons. They're sort of the gatekeeper. They're also providing these biological profiles uh, in terms of these remains, and all of this information now has a place to go, and you're going to hear a lot more later about NamUs, the National Missing Unidentified System and where it's really being a repository for the, this information that can be queried. Um, they assemble and review all the case-related paperwork and, again, get this information into NamUs. And as far as our laboratory here in, in Fort Worth, they really do a phenomenal job of selecting the most appropriate specimens for DNA analysis that give us the greatest likelihood of obtaining a DNA result so that we can enter those results into the National Missing Persons uh, databases. Um, one of our goals is to try and maintain these bones in intact fashion as possible, only taking these small windows. The idea is to make the identifications and return the remains to the families uh, for proper burial. And again, as I said, through the selection, the, uh, the selection of the most appropriate samples, it greatly enhances our chance of success. Uh, here, um, I apologize for the, way the slide is popping up, but uh, as far as our, the um, Molecular Biology Laboratory is on the, the uh, UNT Fort Worth campus where the medical school resides at the UNT Health Science Center. Uh, the segments that are provided to us by the Anthropology Lab are uh, essentially uh, cut into smaller pieces. They're put into these specialized tubes, you may be able to see a bar in the background, a magnetic bar. Uh, this is inserted into this freezer mill, which enables us uh, with liquid nitrogen to pulverize the bone into powder. That powder is then go through a laborious extraction process. Uh, the DNA that's obtained is then amplified in these thermocyclers that are shown and run on the ABI 3100, uh, 3130XLs in this particular case. This is just an example of uh, an electropherogram, uh, uh, an STR profile using the identifier system from uh, extracted bone. This, in fact, is a complete profile. Um, the types of profiles that we obtain from remains vary from complete profiles to uh, some that we don't obtain any STRs. The key to the success of the identification of these human remains is the ability for law enforcement to obtain uh, family reference samples. We could receive all the remains that exist in the United States, but unless we have something to compare them to, we'll never make these identifications. So really, the success is very much driven, like in the forensic cases, with the increase in the offender databases, the success of identifying these human remains is dependent upon law enforcement obtaining these family reference samples. And you'll hear a lot more about the necessity and the requirements in terms of family reference samples uh, throughout uh, this webinar. The most useful family reference samples are from close relatives. If you have a missing person, uh, the biological mother and the biological father are the two most important family reference samples, followed by children and siblings, brothers and sisters. What we're asking is for law enforcement to try and obtain minimally two family reference samples. Um, we'll be able to process typically two to three family reference samples, but the more you submit in the event that we need additional information, uh, if you submitted three, four, five, 
will have them there rather than having to go back to you. So the minimum number is two, um, and preference would be three. And again, you'll hear more about that. This is just an example of a, a pedigree tree. The red box in the center represents the missing person. The uh, uh, individuals in green circles are, are females, squares are males. So you can see parents on the, the in one line. You can see a sibling here in green on the right. You can see a spouse, which is very important in uh, looking at the children of this missing person. Again, uh, what we use here is the Identifiler uh, Kit. It is a CODIS accepted kit. Um, uh, Promega uh, uh, produces the PowerPlex 16, but uh, we're utilizing the Identifiler system here. Again, uh, other lineage-based STR systems are the Y chromosomal STR markers, and you can go further away from the missing person looking at uh, grandparents, a grandfather in this case, uh, uncles, and even distant relatives along a paternal lineage shown in green. Here's an example of a, the Amplistar y filer kit, which allows us to identify these markers on the Y chromosome that are inherited in a paternal lineage. One of the most important systems that we utilize is the analysis of mitochondrial DNA. In this uh, mock-up of a cell, you can see these cigar-shaped organelles. There are many mitochondria per cell. Each mitochondria contains numbers of copies of the mitochondrial genome. It is probably the most important um, sample type in the event that we're not able to obtain sufficient amount of STR material. The analysis of, S of mitochondrial DNA is most appropriately used in, in these samples, uh, uh, skeletal samples, bones, teeth, and here you have an example of a telogen hair, which is one of the most common samples found uh, at crime scenes. Uh, here are some reasons, advantages for using the mitochondrial DNA. It's in high copy number. Uh, we have only one, uh, you know, we're diploid. We have two copies of our genomic DNA, whereas we have hundreds, perhaps thousands of copies per cell of our mitochondrial DNA. Because of the structure of the mitochondria, it, it's less prone to degradation, and this often is the only sample that can be obtained from very old skeletal remains or those that have been environmentally challenged. Again, it is a lineage-based marker. Mitochondria are inherited in a maternal inheritance pattern from mother to children, and then uh, uh, females, daughters, then pass it on to their children. And again, it doesn't have the same discrimination power as our nuclear STRs, yet it's still highly va uh, variable between individuals and is an important tool that needs to be utilized in the identification of human remains. And again, you can see the maternal lineage pattern shown here, going from grandmothers, uh, great-grandmothers, to aunts, and so forth. Uh, in mitochondrial DNA, we look at the actual base composition of certain regions within the mitochondrial genome. This is an example of a sequencing electropherogram where the different colored peaks represent uh, the different uh, DNA bases. Now, what do we do once we obtain this genetic information, these DNA profiles or these mitochondrial um, haplotype information or YSTR haplotype information? Well, our goal is to get these into the, uh, the FBI's uh, combined DNA indexing system. Most of you know it as CODIS. CODIS uh, evolved, has evolved over the last 20 years. But the essence of it, it's a blend between forensic science and computer technology. The, the, together, they provide a very effective tool. The basis for CODIS was to provide law enforcement investigators with leads to assist them in solving crimes. And I think the majority of you are very aware of the impact of CODIS on crimes such as uh, rape, murder, and, and uh, you know, other violent crimes. It enables uh, local, state, and, and federal laboratories to communicate and exchange information in an attempt to solve these crimes. Here is the, the CODIS architecture, and you see three levels. LDIS represents a local, the local DNA indexing system. The local labs feed to their state 
indexing system. Here in Texas, we're considered a local laboratory, so we're an eldest laboratory here at the Center for Human Identification. We feed up to the Estes lab in Texas, which is the Austin DPS, which then uploads information to ENDIS, the national uh, DNA, DNA indexing system. And this allows communication from uh, the local level throughout the United States when samples are appropriate to upload from both local to state and then, uh, if possible, to, to the national. Um, most of you are very f uh, familiar with the offender databases, the convicted of offender databases, and the arrestee databases. I think uh, now there are well over 7 million individuals in the convicted offender database, and the arrestee databases, depending upon state laws and federal laws, are, are being uh, well populated. Forensic crime scene samples, there are several hundred thousand profiles from forensic crime scene samples. Only within the last, I'd say, five years have the missing person databases in CODIS actually being utilized. Uh, there are three databases under the missing persons uh, uh, domain. That is the profiles from unidentified human remains, the direct uh, reference samples from missing persons. These could be baby teeth, DNA obtained from a toothbrush, from a hairbrush, or things that contain biological material from the missing individual. And the third, and the one that's probably utilized the most in terms of identifying the human remains, are the family reference samples. These are samples that are voluntarily contributed by loved ones who have uh, uh, someone missing that they like to identify in their family. Now, for many years, CODIS has been used for forensic uh, crimes, uh, sexual assaults, homicides. However, in, in that case, you're making direct comparisons between uh, evidentiary samples and known individuals. That is not the typical way that we utilize these databases to identify missing persons. We're utilizing relatives. So we're doing what we call relationship testing. So it's not simply the direct comparison of STRs. We need additional tools these lineage-based markers that I talked about, mitochondrial DNA, which links maternal relatives, YSTR markers, which link paternal relatives. And we need different searching algorithms to allow us to compare these reference samples to the unidentified remains. In addition, there's other non-genetic evidence that becomes important. This non-genetic evidence is referred to as metadata. For instance, where was the body found? When was it found? Um, the sex of the remains. Uh, are there any uh, scars, marks, tattoos? Has there been any surgical procedures where there's some types of uh, uh, things that were left in the body? And ultimately, we need the ability to add other genetic tools. Now, that didn't exist and doesn't exist in, the, in the, the CODIS that is found in, you know, roughly 180 plus labs in the United States. There was a need for the development of a new CODIS, and, and today that is referred to as CODIS 6.0.1. And here is a map. Uh, there are only a handful of laboratories in the United States that have access today to 6.0.1. And the two prominent labs that are doing this type of testing throughout the United States are the FBI's National Missing Persons Laboratory and our cells. Uh, between the two of us, we will take samples from any jurisdiction. California Department of Justice actually has a, a tremendous missing persons laboratory, and being the largest state, they probably have the largest number of remains, and they will also on occasion take samples from, from other states. You can see here in blue are some of the labs that were uh, more recently created. Um, with the FBI, the OCME, not one of those laboratories, but certainly has a very large active missing persons program. But predominantly between our lab in Texas and the FBI's missing persons laboratory, we provide these services, both of us, at no charge to um, uh, agencies throughout the United States. Okay, I mentioned metadata. Metadata, this non-genetic data, can be very, very important in helping to uh, distinguish between possible associations made with DNA. Now, the associations made with DNA uh, are, uh, you know, affected by the quality and the quantity of the DNA that we recover. 
And for law enforcement, it is very important that you try and gather as much of this non-genetic data, which can be uploaded not only into CODIS, but into NamUs that will significantly assist in the investigation of the identification and potential apprehension of uh, perpetrators. Okay, so as far as the human remains, what is some of this uh, non-genetic data, metadata? Where were the remains found? When were they found? How long have they been there approximately? Are they male or female? Was the individual the approximate height, um, the, the, the race, population affinity group? Were there any scars, marks, tattoos, medical anomalies? And did we get a complete skeletal remains, the one recovered, or were they just partial? Okay, so as I said, the more metadata, the better in terms of uh, assisting in these associations leading to identifications. One of the things that the new CODIS does, it allows us to build these pedigree trees. That's why there is an absolute need for more than a single reference sample. It also affects the level of um, searching that can be done. Here we have a missing individual shown with the question mark, a male. You have uh, the biological mother, the biological uh, father, and a sister, a sibling. With those reference samples, uh, uh, obtaining the genetic information will greatly enhance our ability to identify uh, the remains. One of the new things is that allows us, in the old, in CODIS 5.7.4, one could typically only upload STR data. Now we can upload not only STR data, but YSCR data and, and mitochondrial profiles. Now one of the things that we found is that sometimes it's very difficult to get full um, profiles of the core 13 loci using standard amplification conditions. Uh, these are samples often classified as low template, low copy number samples. Um, we've received over 2,600 remains, and approximately 500 of them, we've had to go to increased cycle number. Now, as many of you are aware, that data cannot be uploaded to ENDIS, yet we maintain this at the eldest level. We have over 500 sets of remains where we've used these in uh, increased cycle number and have obtained extensive DNA. And from those, although they remain here at our eldest level, we've been able to make many identifications. They cannot be uploaded to ENDIS yet because of the number of, of reference samples and samples we get, uh, direct reference samples, we're able to make identifications at the ELDIS level, which could never be made today at the ENDIS level. I'm gonna go through this fairly quickly because I think it's really important for those of you in law enforcement to really hear about the tools that are available to you outside of the laboratory testing tools but the support tools that are available for our, um, our forensic services unit. So um, these PowerPoints uh, will be made available, available to you as PDFs, where if there's something I can't cover in any detail, you'll be able to see uh, when they're presented to you. All right, um, you know, how it works. The profiles are developed here at our laboratory. We're an eldest laboratory, and we also process a significant number of family reference samples. Um, from, from our laboratory, we do many different searches. We've received to date over 2,600 human remains and well over 5,000 family reference samples. I'm pleased to say at this point, we essentially have no backlogs. Virtually all of the samples that we received have been completed or in process, and we're looking for samples. We want to have some measure of backlog. Um, so we're encouraging you to send these samples either to our laboratory, to the FBI, or to other laboratories that are capable of doing the, the testing needed to identify these human remains. So the searching is done here at the eldest level. If um, no associations are made at the eldest level, they're sent up to Estes. And if they meet the requirement at Estes, if no associations are made at Estes, they're then sent up to Endis. Okay. One of the things that's important for you to understand, and, and this uh, is not often conveyed, although samples may be sent to ENDIS, they may, they may uh, meet the upload requirements. If they don't contain a sufficient amount of, DNA, uh, of uh, genetic information, 
or if not more than one technology, let's say only STRs are done, then they may not be searched. So this is something that is not commonly known because people think that if you send your information up to ENDIS, it's going to be searched. So the quality of the data um, really at ENDIS uh, will determine what's searched. For instance, UHR profiles must have at least eight of the 13 core markers plus amylogen and by itself to be searched. Um, and many samples require a second technology in order to be searched. And that's uh, to some extent uh, shown here, at least in terms of the STRs, what is needed. Um, the family reference samples require full STRs, uh, loci plus amylogenin. Um, the remains require minimally of eight core loci plus amylogenin. However, if you add the mitochondrial DNA profiles, which is really the, the second uh, technology at this point, then um, it changes the searching parameters. Today, even though YSTRs can be uploaded, um, they're not used per se in the search as a search tool. Examples of the searches that can be done with unidentified human remains, remains to remains, remains against the missing person's direct reference samples, uh, even remains against convicted offenders. We recently identified, uh, uh, well, we matched or uh, a UHR that we had to two sexual assault cases and to the convicted offender. The, the good news is that individuals deceased will never uh, assault another woman. The bad news is we'll probably never know who that individual is. Um, UHRs against these associations of family reference samples. The UHRs can be searched against uh, a mother, a father, or a child. However, if you only had a single reference sample, such as a brother or a sister, um, it won't be searched unless there's additional technologies. And this is going to be covered a little more uh, through the FSU. So a single reference sample, unless it has a second technology like MITO, will not be searched. Um, here, talking about the different uh, times at which searching takes place, and it really depends upon the family reference samples and the number of technologies that are provided. One of the things that you should be aware of that uh, if you have what we call a warm um, uh, case where you think you know who the individual might be, it's really important to send both the family reference samples and the remains to the same lab. That will facilitate uh, greatly the association. Um, the missing person samples will be searched against uh, the forensic index, the UHR against the forensic index, and missing person against uh, uh, offenders. Now, one of the things you need to know is that the family reference samples can only be searched against the unidentified remains. These are voluntarily contributed, and the only searching that can be done is against the remains. It can't be searched against any of the other indices. Again, in terms of the searchings that are done at INDES, um, typically um, they're done on a, a monthly basis unless they don't have the sufficient uh, amount of genetic information. Then you saw some uh, searches are done quarterly. But the one thing is if it doesn't hit initially, that doesn't stop the process. These samples will continually be searched as new samples are added. Um, so to try and, and get through is that uh, if identifications can't be made by conventional means, we have a whole battery of DNA-based technologies, nuclear STRs, mitochondrial DNA, YSTRs, in the future single nucleotide polymorphisms. So these tools can only be utilized if you provide labs like us, the FBI, and a handful of other labs with these samples to do the analysis and upload into uh, CODIS. So we believe that every family member, we call this family's rights, that every family member with a loved one should have the assurance from the legal system and, and the, the medical legal system that none of these remains will be essentially cremated, buried without the retention of sample. Without the retention of a sample, these identifications will never be made. And not only do these samples need to be retained, they need to be sent 
to those laboratories with the technology to analyze them and get them up into our uh, National Missing Persons databases. Each family member who files a missing persons report needs to be informed that their information is, is being put up into the National Missing and Unidentified Person System, NamUs, which you'll hear more about in a few minutes, and that they have the voluntary ability to provide these family reference samples in the search of their loved one. And each of these remains who are most likely a victim, they have the right to be reunited with their families before they're laid to rest. So the tools that are available to you, not only through our organization, but through the FBI and, and a handful of other entities are the Forensic Anthropological Tools, the DNA Tools, the ability to enter samples into NamUs. And as you'll hear in just a minute, how you can utilize uh, our Forensic Services Unit to help you work with you in each step of the process, and they'll go into more detail. Just an idea of our success, um, you know, we've received uh, somewhere well over 5,000 uh, reference samples, family reference samples. We've received over 2,600 human remains, and to date we've identified well over 500 of these uh, individuals. And as a result of these identifications, murder investigations have been started, uh, perpetrators identified, trials have taken place, and individuals convicted of the murder of that once unidentified decedent. So utilizing these tools, not only could you help the family who's grieving, who wants to know where their loved one is, but through the identification process, potentially identify the perpetrator and potentially save other lives. So with that, I don't think we'll have time to talk about the human trafficking aspects of what we do and how the same technologies can be used for human trafficking. Uh, I'm going to turn it back to Ilsa and uh, to BJ Spama to talk about the work of our Forensic Services Unit. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Art. Yes, uh, it's unfortunate we don't have time to get through um, right now the, the trafficking piece. And um, I'm going to tell everyone on the call what I think would be great um, at a point in the near future is if we could do actually an entire webinar on the work you do um, with DNA Pro Kids because it's really Great program, and I hate to miss it now, but I think um, we'll have to to move on to um, to BJ. And I have sorry, I know people were having a little issue with the slides, but I think we have that figured out now. Um, I am going to hand control over to BJ Spammer, and she's going to take it from here. So it looks like you have the controls, BJ. Okay, thank you, Ilsa, and thank mm -hmm. you for the opportunity to present here today and talk to you about the Forensic Services Unit. George Adams is also on the line, so he'll be available to jump in or answer any questions after the fact. But we want to finish up the presentation with a brief explanation of what the Forensic Services Unit is and what we can do for you. The primary mission of the Forensic Services Unit is to provide the training and resources to support missing and unidentified investigations across the country. So we don't just work with law enforcement officers, medical examiners, and coroners. We also work directly with the families of missing loved ones. We work with victim advocates, and we work with other nonprofit agencies. Now, the specific initiatives and resources that we offer are listed in this slide as a reference for you to refer back to. But I won't read you this slide because we're going to go through each of these bullet points as we talk about each resource. As Dr. Eisenberg mentioned, it's very important that we get family reference samples collected so that we can identify these bodies that are currently in CODIS with DNA profiles. And he mentioned the importance of collecting at least two, if not more, family reference samples. One of the primary things that we focus on in the Forensic Services Unit are to drive the collection and submission of those samples. So if you're going to send those DNA profiles into the University of North Texas, we offer DNA collection kits that will give you all the materials, all the consent forms, the return envelope, everything that you need to collect that DNA sample and get that into UNT. We also want to make sure that whatever laboratory you're using, we are using more than one technology. As Dr. Eisenberg mentioned, we want to get not only the STR profiles, 
but also the mitochondrial DNA profiles, and when appropriate, now the YSTR profiles. And he talked about the importance of collecting a DNA sample that is a direct reference for the missing person. So I want to expand on that a little bit and talk a little bit more about why we might want to collect those direct DNA reference samples in addition to the family member samples. And Dr. Eisenberg mentioned that those direct DNA samples can be put into CODIS and searched against all of the other DNA profiles in the system, not just against the unidentified remains. A direct profile from a missing person can be searched against the convicted offenders and those forensic unknown profiles. And in the next slide, I'm going to show you a case that recently came out in the news that I think is a really good illustration of why we might want to consider using these direct profiles now. But before I move on, I, I wanted to mention as well that even when we're collecting those direct samples, like a toothbrush, we also still want to get those family reference samples in with that direct sample. Having the family references will serve as a checks and balances for the analyst that's doing your DNA profiling. That will allow them to make sure the profile that they get off of that toothbrush or that other direct reference is consistent with the family members and they don't have to worry about any type of contamination that may have occurred. Now back to searching those direct profiles against all of the other profiles in CODIS. This is a case that came out in the news a couple of weeks ago, and even though DNA was not used in this particular case, the implications of this case to our missing persons, our runaways, and maybe our adults who are voluntarily missing, this is a great case to illustrate why we can use those direct reference samples. This is a man who, in a, as a teenager in college, he decided to essentially walk away from his life. And he assumed the identity of a young boy who was murdered in 1982. For 15 years, this man lived under that assumed identity. And for many of those years, he worked in a state government job that required a pre-employment background investigation. He passed that background investigation using this alias identity. And he wasn't discovered until 15 years later when he applied for a passport. Now think about this case in relation to the runaway children. And if they do come into contact with law enforcement and for any reason are um, convicted of a crime or out there committing crimes, and we've got a direct DNA profile for the missing person, we can come up with associations like this in CODIS. This gentleman was convicted, or I'm sorry, he was charged with providing false information on a passport application. So he will be eventually likely be a convicted offender. Now, along those same lines, we also, of course, drive the collection and submission of unidentified remain samples. And we have a lot of the same considerations with those. We want to make sure that those are subjected, again, to more than one DNA technology. We want to make sure we have more than just the STR profiles. We also have the mitochondrial profiles. And there's another issue that Dr. Eisenberg touched on that we wanted to expand on just a little bit more, and that is the issue with some of these profiles not being accepted up into the National DNA Index system yet. This is something that you do need to keep in the back of your mind, especially if you have a missing or unidentified person case and you have a, a potential match. You have a missing person and you've come across an unidentified case that you think could match your missing person. You may have heard terms like low copy number or SNPs. These are terms that refer to some of the newer technologies or techniques that are being used to develop STR profiles, where several years ago we could not get an STR profile because the remains were degraded. And when those newer technologies are being used, as Dr. Eisenberg said, they are only allowable in the, in the statewide CODIS systems right now. They cannot go up to the national level. So, for instance, if we had an unidentified remains case that came into the University of North Texas and we used one of these newer technologies, that STR profile is going to remain in the Texas system. And maybe California Department of Justice has a missing person that is a match to that unidentified case. But because their profiles have gone into the California system and then up to the national system, they're not available for comparison to our, our profiles in the statewide database. 
So that is an issue that you do need to be aware of, and this is typically something you're only going to come across when you have two different laboratories in two different states doing the DNA work and one of these newer technologies is used. Now, there is a workaround to this. If you do have a potential match that you think one of these issues could come up in and you want those DNA profiles compared, if UNT was involved in either case, if we did the DNA profiling for the missing or the unidentified, there is a form that you can fill out and our CODIS administrator can manually compare those DNA profiles to make sure that we've not missed anything by relying on the national searching. And before I move off of the unidentified slide, I wanted to point out Mark Ingraham and Dixie Peters' information. Um, Dr. Eisenberg talked about our anthropology unit. Mark is in our anthropology unit. Dixie Peters is a technical leader in our DNA laboratory. Both of them are available to give you one-on-one -on -one case consultations before you send any unidentified remains into the laboratory because each case is going to be specific. You're going to have a different sample available to you. The condition of the sample might be different. You might have remains that have been out in the elements for 10 or 20 years or longer. And Mark and Dixie will give you a case consultation to find out what kind of samples you have, what condition they're in, and then tell you what the best samples to send in to the DNA laboratory will be, the samples that are going to be most likely to yield a DNA profile. So you can contact Mark or Dixie for those consultations, or if you have any doubt about which you should contact, of course, George and I can get you to the right person that you need. Now, very quickly, I want to talk about our partnership with NamUs, or the National Missing and Unidentified Person System. If you're not yet familiar with NamUs, I would encourage you to go to their website, which is www.namus.gov, G-O-V. NamUs is a tremendous program that is helping us to resolve missing and unidentified cases. And two important elements of the NamUs system are the missing persons database and the unidentified persons database. And these databases allow not only law enforcement, but also families and victim advocate groups to enter cases into the system. Now, the Forensic Services Unit works very closely with NamUs, not only to help facilitate DNA collections for NamUs cases, but we can also help them fill in the DNA screens in each of these cases. So if UNT has been involved in the DNA analysis, we can indicate that it's been done, what type of DNA profiles we have, and even our CODIS reference number. So it's a good way to document that DNA collections have been done, but also, if one of those manual comparisons are ever needed between a missing and unidentified, all of the information that both laboratories need is already on this screen. Now, George and I have also been assisting NamUs with what we call the orphaned cases, for lack of a better term. It is unfortunate, but there are a lot of families that are still being turned away when they're trying to report a missing person's case to law enforcement, especially when they're trying to report missing adult cases. But these families still do need our help, and they need to get their DNA profiles into CODIS. So George and I are working with NamUs. When they have a report of a case, either from a family member or a victim advocate, someone working with the family, and the case is not yet on file with law enforcement, George and I will work with that family to get that DNA collected and into CODIS. And also our goal is to try and get a law enforcement agency on board to get that missing persons report filed and get that missing person entered into NCIC as well as NamUs. And no NamUs talk would be complete without mentioning the case of Two St. Gums because it is such a perfect example of how the system can and does work to resolve missing and unidentified cases. Two St. went missing from Virginia back in June of 1995. The date of his last contact was reported to be June the 9th of 1995. We know now that that date is incorrect, and we know that because Two Saints' body was actually recovered three days prior on June the 6th of 1995. But for many, many years, that's the date that everyone had to work with, and that's the date that all searches were based on. Now, we were able to get DNA collected from family members and get that into CODIS through UNT's partnership with the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children 
we've been working with NECMEC since 2004 to assist them in getting all of the reference samples from their families of long-term and endangered missing children into CODIS. So we did get family reference samples for Toussaint into CODIS, but we did not get any associations out of the DNA database. It wasn't until several years later when the Virginia Office of the Medical Examiner began their own NamUs program and went back through all of their cases of unidentified remains and started entering them into the system. And they entered this case of an unidentified young man found on June the 6th of 1995. A private citizen who is a member of a, a, a volunteer group called the Doe Network came across this particular case and started running their searches of missing persons to see if she could find any possible matches to this unidentified young man. She came across the case of Toussaint Gums and realized that there were a lot of similarities despite the fact that there was an issue with that date of last contact versus the date the body was found. And one of the most significant, of course, both were found in the same state and missing from the same state, but also both boys had a scar on their upper left thigh. So she reported that to NECMEC as a lead, and NECMEC immediately reached out to the medical examiner's office, who had retained a blood card and was able to profile the DNA of their decedent and compare that with the family reference samples that UNT could provide and after 13 years of being missing, Toussaint was finally identified and returned back to his family for proper burial. So this is a perfect example of how the NamUs system works along with the volunteers that are helping to compare these cases and providing some tips that are resolving cases for us. Now the Forensic Services Unit also partnered with Project EDEN. EDEN is an acronym that stands for Everyone Deserves a Name. This is a group of certified forensic artists who volunteer their time and their talents to investigators who need forensic art. So they can create composite sketches when we have unidentified remains cases. And we can now get those composite sketches into NamUs. We found that those composite sketches not only bring a lot more attention to the unidentified case itself, forensic art has been instrumental in solving some of these cases. Bernard Wilson is a perfect example of how forensic art can help solve a case. Bernard went missing in uh, March or April of 2005. He was a resident of Lubbock. He was 17 years old and attending high school there. Now, for whatever reason, Bernard was not reported missing when he was last seen in March or April of 2005. And unfortunately, that same year, his remains were found, but it was not immediately known that these remains belonged to Bernard. It was in December of 2005 that skeletal remains of a homicide victim were found just outside of Lubbock. The remains were skeletal, so they were sent to a forensic anthropologist to do an assessment of height and weight and, and sex and race, and all of that information was entered into the Texas Department of Public Safety's Unidentified Persons website. The remains were also sent in to UNT to develop a profile and load them into CODIS. Now, several leads did surface, and one of which was Corey White. Corey White was the young boy also missing from Texas who fit the general parameters of the unidentified body and was investigated as a possible match. So DNA was collected from his family member and compared to that body. And in a uh, bit of a bittersweet twist in this case, the family reference sample that was compared to the body resulted in an exclusion. Corey White was not the body found in Lubbock, Texas. However, the family member's profile did produce a cold hit to a completely different body that had been found in Hood County, Texas in December of 2004. So a bittersweet ending in that we, we now know that Corey White was also deceased, but at least there's finally some answers in his case. So back now to the decedent found in Lubbock, Texas. He's still unidentified. So a forensic artist was commissioned to create a sketch to show what this decedent may have looked like in life. And in December, uh, December 18th of 2007, the Texas Department of Public Safety released that sketch, and in two days, Bernard Wilson's father contacted the sheriff's office to indicate that that sketch resembled his son, and he thought the decedent might be Bernard. Now, 
there were no dental radiographs or casts. There was only a paper written chart of Bernard's uh, dental records. So a scientific identification could not be made through dental comparisons. So a family reference samples were collected. And as a result of that DNA comparison, a positive identification could be made of Bernard Wilson. And the final result in that case is that within two months of that identification being made, six separate individuals were charged and arrested with Bernard's murder. Two have already been uh, already pled guilty and received 25 and 29, cent 29 year sentences respectively, and the other four are still pending disposition, but it's obvious that resolution is going to be made all around in this particular case. Not only was Bernard identified so his, his family could give him a proper burial, we also had justice for Bernard's family and a collateral identification of Corey White as a result of this investigation. And that's something you're going to run into when you publicize your unidentified cases and you release these composite sketches, you're going to have a lot of family members contacting you because they think that the decedent could be their missing loved one. And this is the perfect opportunity to use your case to collect all of those DNA samples and get them into CODIS. Because even if these individuals are not a match to your decedent that you've recovered in your jurisdiction, those DNA samples could produce a cold hit to another case in CODIS like Corey White did and bring resolution to yet another family and another agency that's working on their own unidentified case. Okay, we're not going to have much time. I think I'm already running a little bit over. So very quickly, I'm just going to show you a couple of places where you can get some additional information about the FSU. If you're a social networker, we are on Facebook, and we post periodic updates on there about upcoming training events and newsletters that we're releasing. We have similar content on our website at untfsu.com. You'll notice some tabs across the top of the screen. One is for newsletters. If you click on that tab, it will bring you to links to download our monthly newsletters that the FSU is putting out. Now, these are a collaboration. Uh, from not only the FSU, but from agencies and investigators and experts and family members and victim advocates across the United States. We encourage everyone to participate in these newsletters because we want to share information on what everyone across the U.S. is doing to help resolve these missing and unidentified cases and bring you the resources and information you need to work them. There's also a tab that will give you um, links to news articles on tons and tons of identifications that have been made of missing persons through DNA. And along similar lines, we have a general news tab where you can download additional information on different topics related to missing and unidentified persons as well as DNA. And you might be able to see on the top of this section our featured links deal with familial DNA searching, which has been a really hot topic lately. And there's a link to a presentation by Rockney Harmon, which is a phenomenal explanation of what familial DNA searching is and how it's done. We also have a download link where you can download not only our DNA forms, but also some additional resources that we're putting out. If you work on a number of missing and unidentified cases and you're collecting DNA in them, you may need a tool to help you track those collections. What cases do you have? What DNA has already been collected? Who have you collected it from? Is it in CODIS? If so, what is the CODIS number? We have provided a simple Microsoft Access database from our website. You can download it from that tab. And this is, a, again, a simple Microsoft Access system that you can download and enter all of your cases into and track your DNA collections. And it is an open source database, so you can very easily modify it to drop in your own logos and create your own custom reports or anything that you need out of it. We also talked about how Profiles may not necessarily be up on the national level, or you might have concern that two cases are a match, but for one reason or another you're afraid that these newer technologies were used, the profiles might not be national, maybe you didn't have enough family reference samples, and you're concerned that an automatic association would not be made in CODIS. We do have a form that you can download off of our website to request a manual comparison of DNA profiles. 
So you fill out the information on your particular case and send that into UNT. Our CODIS administrator will pull up the profiles that we developed at UNT and compare them to yours and give you a, a result of that comparison. And finally, we have an events tab on our website where we list any upcoming training on DNA, CODIS, missing persons investigations, cold case investigations. The very top event that's listed is a missing and unidentified persons workshop that we're helping to implement with the Virginia Beach Police Department. Now this is a pilot program that the FSU is working on with Virginia Beach. We are um, piloting a program to support local and state conferences. So the host agency on these conferences is the local agency, in this case Virginia Beach Police Department. It is their conference. We are simply a behind-the-scenes support to help them plan, create flyers. We have a database that we can provide to help track the registrants and create certificates and class rosters. So we're working to support this particular conference. The event is listed on our web page under that events tab if you're interested in registering. Um, but also we do envision that this pilot program will will become nationwide and we will support other agencies in uh, both state and local throughout the United States. So there, are, I think we do have some time for questions and answers, but if you do have questions or specific cases that you want to talk to us about, please don't hesitate to contact George or I anytime. It is our privilege and our honor to help you and through you to help the family members who have been victimized by these missing persons cases. So thank you again so much for your time and being here today, and I'll turn everything back over to Ilsa. Okay, thanks so much, BJ. Um, we do have two questions. We have a little bit of time, um, and I, this one is just specifically about NamUs, so I thought maybe this would be a good first question. Um, who enters the information into NamUs? into NamUs, and is this in addition to NCIC? And I know there's been a lot of dialogue about how those two um, systems would communicate. Can you talk for a minute about that? Sure. NamUs is a system in addition to NCIC, so it's not a system designed to replace NCIC. It is a whole system in and of itself. And the cases can be entered by anyone, actually. A law enforcement agency can enter a case, a family member, a nonprofit like the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, or even George and I could enter a particular case. Now, the case is not immediately made available for public viewing. Just because it's entered into NamUs does not mean that public citizens can see that particular case. It does go behind the scenes until it can be vetted and verified as a legitimate missing persons case. Okay, great. And then this one is a more general question. This might be for Art. Um, do all the United States military services currently collect DNA samples and have DNA databases of all their personnel? And if so, is this searchable by law enforcement? Uh, the Armed Forces uh, DNA Identification Lab, AFDL, which is uh, under the AFIP, for many, many years had the largest uh, DNA database in the world. Um, now the CODIS databases, certainly the convicted offender databases, have uh, surpassed that. But it's my understanding uh, when anyone enlists or had been previously enlisted in the military, uh, a sample uh, had been obtained and that sample not necessarily had their profile determined at the time, but uh, that sample is available for uh, a genetic profile that in the event of uh, some uh, catastrophic event in the military or uh, that these uh, bodies can be identified. Okay. Was, uh, was there a second part to the question? No. Uh, no, that was it. I was looking just to see if we had any more questions come in, but it doesn't look like we, we do. I think we are pretty much out of time. Um, I want to. I just really want to thank you all for your presentation, and and I think you um, are some of the most committed and driven people um, to make real change that I've ever met in this arena. And I want to thank you so much for the work that you do all the time. And I know you don't get much sleep, any of you, because <laughs> you're very committed. Um, everybody, please note that today's presentation was recorded, so it will be a mail made available online. Um, give us a few days. We'll have the PowerPoint presentations and the link to the recording on our website at the um, website you see here. And we will send an email to all participants when that information is posted on our website. So 
um, make sure to visit our website to learn about our future webinars. Like I said, I think what we will do is go ahead and try to schedule a webinar specifically about the using DNA in trafficking cases. Um, we could definitely do a whole webinar on that. So um, just thank you so much for listening, and we hope you have a so good afternoon. May I add one thing, oh, please? Sure. Yeah, and absolutely. I'm not sure it came across. Uh, not only are the services that the laboratories and the FSU uh, available at no cost, but I'm not sure we mentioned that we have grant funding to provide all of these family reference sample coll uh, collection kits across the country at no charge. Um, and they can be obtained uh, by any of these agents, law enforcement agencies, and, and those that have m been mentioned by uh, BJ at absolutely no charge. So uh, they're mm -hmm. available either requesting it through the NamUs website or directly through us. So I just wanted to make sure that that was clear. I apologize for interrupting No, you. and that's actually a great point. And I want to say um, this has come up before in these conversations about what uh, – I'm throwing this question out there, even though – we're supposed to be done, but um, what should someone do locally if they could not get their local law enforcement to take um, a, a sample and send it to UNT? Is there anything that they could do? Uh, BJ, can you uh, handle that, please? Yeah, we, we have been working, and we've had several cases like that, and what we'll do is the family member typically ends up contacting us directly to ask about getting their DNA sample into CODIS, and we will reach out. If we can't get an officer in a local agency to do the collection, we'll reach out to any of our partners across the U.S. We've got a lot of uh, investigators in state agencies that will assist us, so we will find someone that will collect that DNA sample so we can get it into CODIS. Okay. So they would just contact you guys? Yes. Yeah, okay. Wonderful. Okay. I think that's it. Um, thank you all for listening, and we hope to see you on a future webinar. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.